Moving off of the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, we see a parallel between God establishing His kingdom with His king by His word, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and the gospel of Matthew, the arrival of the king and his kingdom. And I love how these two books are tied together from both the Old Testament, or what's called the Hebrew Scriptures, in the historical section, and the New Testament, one of the synoptic gospels, meaning it's in order chronologically, these narratives, and how it comes together. And we see God is doing a magnificent, amazing thing as He seeks to, by His power and His glory and His sovereign hand, redeem His creation, redeem a people for His glory. And so I thought what would be helpful this morning is to dip back in to the book of Samuel for just a moment and make a connection, a connection you may not have seen before. You don't need to turn there, but if you'll write down 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 18. I want to read through verse 25 and make a, a connection regarding the issue or the topic of worship. So Gad came to David that day and said to him, Go up and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aronah, the Jebusite. David went up according to the word of Gad, just as the Lord had commanded. Aronah looked down and saw the king and his servants crossing over toward him. And Aronah went out and bowed his face to the ground before the king. Then Aronah said, Why has the Lord, the king, come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be held back from the people. Aronah said to David, let the Lord my king take and offer what is good in his sight. Look, oxen for the burnt offering, the threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. Everything, O king, Aronah gives to the king. And Aronah said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. However, the king said to Aronah, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price, for I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. David built an altar to the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Thus, the Lord was moved by prayer for the land, and the plague was held back from Israel. You've heard the saying that salvation is free, but discipleship costs. Meaning we know that it costs to live for Christ. Our salvation does not cost, but it costs to follow Christ. And our response in worship is the same way. Salvation is free, but, but worship costs us something. Meaning that we have to choose in a good way to worship over something else. Listen to this definition of worship. Worship is all that we are responding to all that we know of Him. And when we bow the knee to our Lord, even when you're here today, it's costing you something. You may remember from your Economics 101 class, in college, opportunity cost, that at the very least it is costing you to be here rather than do something else. You are choosing because you value worshiping our Lord. But I like David's attitude here because it's, it's really brought to bear. He actually wants it to cost. He says, you know what? I don't want it to be cheap. How can I offer something, my Lord, that I haven't given of, purchased, haven't sacrificed as it were. David wants it to cost. He wants worship to be costly because he values it. Here's the question as we get going today. Will we be a body that worships if it costs us nothing? Do we value worship? Paul brings this together. The first 11 chapters of Romans are all doctrinal, and then 12 through 16 are practical. And right at the end of that first section, the very last verse of chapter 11 and the very first verse of chapter 12, I think really go together. There's a linchpin there. Remember, there's no chapter breaks or verse 
uh, annotations until the Middle Ages. So I want to read these together and, and show you how they connect. You'll recognize chapter 11, verse 36. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. He says, you know what? The theological and the practical are inextricably linked. Yes, worship is is lifting our voices and giving God glory. But it's also serving Him by serving the body and it costs us and we delightfully do it because we, we value it. In fact, as I look around, I know the daily decisions that each one of you make to sacrifice to serve our Lord by serving His body. That your spiritual service of worship is not just here on Sunday when we're, we're singing and lifting our voices in praise, but it's also ministering to one another. It's also saying, no, I don't have time to do that, which may be important because this is more valuable to serve the body of Christ, to serve my Lord in this way with the gifts and talents that He's given me. The fact is, is that we put our resources towards that which we value. Costing us is actually a good thing. Look at our timeless truth for today. You will worship that which you value the most. Matthew's making a point here in our second chapter. He's saying, this king that I told you about last week, this king that that has the right bloodline, he has the right family tree, and he is not only the son of David, but he has come to fulfill the promises of Abraham that in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. This king that I told you about that is worthy to be king, watch this, is also worthy to be king worshiped that's the point of this second chapter this king this messiah who has come this jesus of of nazareth is not only worthy to be king but so much more he is worthy to be worshiped not just revered like kings not just honored No, a drop to your knees, put it all on the line, count everything as dung, worship with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that kind of king. And I tell you, one of my goals here today as I exposit the Word of God, as I I expose it to you, is I want to put as best as I can, as best as we are humanly able, to put on display Jesus Christ before you as King of kings and Lord of lords and say, if you don't value this above everything else in life, you don't know Christ. Or your heart has grown cold towards the things of Christ. But He is so beautiful. It is so amazing what He has done. I want to put on display, and that's what really good preaching is, is that it's just exposing the Word of God. It's not all these wonderful rhetorical devices or these dog and pony shows. It's simply putting Christ before His people and say, look, He is worthy to be worshipped. And so before we get going here, I want us to immediately sort of dive into some practical application and ask ourselves the question, If you're a believer here today and your heart has maybe grown cold towards valuing Christ, what has supplanted it? What has gotten in the way? Where have your heart's affections been lured away to? Uh, Men, is 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 it the game? Is it toys? Is it the career? Is it just the tyranny of the urgent trying to keep all the plates spinning? Ladies, is it wanting more? Is it security? Is it shopping? All of us, is it food? Okay? Is it the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful part of life? What is it that is vying for our heart's affections? You know, Jonathan Edwards, you've heard me say this before, 
went through just this amazing time during the first great awakening, and he saw a very dead, cold uh, New England come to life. That people's hearts were aflame. There was conversions. There was excitement. And later on, upon reflecting it, people people were asking him, how do you know, Jonathan Edwards, how do you know that those people really became believers? What was the test? Was it the prayer they prayed? Was it how they acted in the service? Was 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 it behavior modification? How do you know that the word of God, the gospel, took root in their life? How do you know someone's a Christian? And he wrote a book. Do you know what it was? It was called Religious Affections. And he answered that question with another question. He said, where do their affections lie? If you find someone whose affections are for Christ, then the conversion was real. If you find someone, basically he's saying, who loves the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and enjoys Him above everything else, there's your believer. There's your true convert. That doesn't mean, let me just give you the flip side of that, it doesn't mean that we're supposed to be monastic, as Aaron was teaching us this morning. That we walk around, you know, we don't talk to people, maybe we wear all brown robes, we don't do anything fun. No, I think Ecclesiastes teaches a dramatically different lifestyle. It says we are to enjoy all that the Lord has given us. All the wonderful things of food and entertainment. But He is to be our top enjoyment. He is to take priority. And if He is, then we will worship Him. We will sacrifice all to worship Him. The big picture of Matthew is that he wants to show us that this Messiah has not only arrived, is the legitimate king, will fulfill the promises of Abraham, but this king is more than human. He is more than just a man. He is Worthy of all of our affections. Worthy of our worship. Two points are going to guide our time this morning, and they have to do with worship. Number one, don't worship like Herod. Pretty simple, right? Number two, worship like wise men. Don't worship like Herod, but worship like wise men. What we're going to see is in this narrative... We've heard the announcement of this king coming. This king arrives, and kings, as it were, rulers, are going to respond in two dramatically different ways. Herod is going to respond in a dramatically different way than these other rulers, wise men. The wise men aren't any better than Herod, and Herod's not any better than the wise men. They are both rank pagans. In fact, Herod's going to have more entrappings and traditions and more exterior clothing, as it were, spiritual clothing, and look more like a believer. But they're going to be both very lost. And when confronted with the king, when a king is confronted with the king of kings, there's no ambiguity. There's no ambivalence. There's a response of worship, or there's a response of fighting for your throne. I love this text. I hope it's one you're all familiar with. I hope we look at it in a very fresh way today. And I hope that it really challenges us because we too, like Herod, have a lot of spiritual clothing that maybe or maybe not is Christian. But when confronted with the king of kings, do we gladly bow the knee? Or do we fight for our throne? Let's look at our first point. Don't worship like Herod. Let me read verses 1 through 3 one more time. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Circle that worship. You're going to see it at least a couple more times. Verse 3 When Herod heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Herod and why he was such a nervous wreck. Herod was not even a Jew, okay? He was called king of the Jews. He wasn't even a Jew. 
much less a royal. His father, Antipater, had been part of Jewish politics during a brief period of independence. And when he saw an opportunity to climb the ladder with Rome, he basically cut a deal with General Pompey. Recognize that? And he let Pompey come in and take over without firing a shot. But later, when Pompey was defeated by Julius Caesar, Antipater switched alliances. In fact, even rescued Julius Caesar from Alexandria. And as a result, he was appointed chief minister and, watch this, tax collector of Judea. Basically, the chief minister had the privilege, had the right to collect taxes for Rome. And we learned about that last week. When you collect taxes, you're able to keep way above whatever is required. Well, as a result of this privilege, he got his son, his little boy, Herod, appointed prefect or governor of Galilee. Herod did such a good job that he was awarded the title King of Galilee of the Jews by Octavian and Antony. I'm going to dust off some of these old Roman names. But what's interesting is we're reading the Bible and we're hearing names like Pompey, Julius Caesar, Octavian and Antony. This is real stuff. But here's the problem. How can you be king of the Jews if you've got no Jewish blood? Hey, I mean... I mean, if the title on your business card is Herod the Great, which, by the way, he, didn't, he wasn't born with that last name. He kind of gave it to himself. And then getting the title King of the Jews, and you're looking at him, it's like, this guy's not even Jewish. He's Edomian. He's, he's an Edomite. Edom, for, meaning red, the land of Edom. He was from the line of Esau, not the line of Jacob. So he was a cousin, but he wasn't even a Jew. So this is a problem, and he realizes it's a problem. So in order to gain credibility, he marries royal blood. He marries a gal named Marianne. Marianne was part of the Hashmonean dynasty. She's kind of royal Jewish blood. This gave him a little credibility, but even this newfound pedigree only took him so far. Because you can have the right bloodline and still not be very likable. And Herod was not very likable. So he needed to be liked. You know, you sort, of, you sort of reign in a sense according to the pleasure of the people, even though it's not a democracy. So he says, how am I going to be liked? Because no one really likes me. I got the bloodline now by marriage. How am I going to be liked? Well, remember, his daddy had the rights to collect taxes. So he took this money that he collected in taxes and he built up the, uh, the Jewish temple. Now that's going to buy you some favor with Jews. You go from having a small little temple, he starts to build the temple built on top of it. And do you remember when Christ says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll rebuild it? Of course, he was talking about his body. Why did they think that that was just so fantastic, meaning just crazy? Because by that time, the temple mount, Herod's temple was magnificent. He had spent 43 years building this thing up. He took this Roman money, he took the taxes, and he built this Roman, I mean, this Jewish temple. But he did more than that. He gave money to the poor, he fed the populace during a famine, he built theaters and racetracks. He basically bought likability. But have you ever heard the old saying, the problem with having money is all the time you spend trying to keep it? The same is true with power. He's finally gained all this power through a bloodline and through buying favor, and now he has to keep it. And Herod's paranoid. And frankly, Herod's evil. His idol had become power. It had become the God, a little G that he served. And so he sacrificed all to feed that God. He worshipped power. He worshipped his own throne. And in order to keep it, he was willing to do anything. This wasn't the first time that Herod had a troubled spirit when it came to a threat on his throne. In order to ensure his position as king, he had, watch this, drowned the high priest. Who, by the way, was his brother-in-law? That's kind of tough, right? He killed his mother-in-law. 
He killed his wife's grandfather. He killed his own wife, Marianne, who gave him the pedigree. He had two of his own sons drowned and executed a third one. You're like, seriously? Now when you look ahead and you realize that he killed all the babies under two in Bethlehem, that's nothing. He didn't even know them. To ensure tears at his own funeral, he arrested many of the nobles in Jerusalem, watch this, and put an order to have them executed at the moment he died, just so people would be crying on the day of his death. Of course, fortunately, they didn't follow through on that one. Herod was so evil that Caesar Augustus uttered his famous pun that he would rather be Herod's huis his pig, rather than his huios, his son. Now, understanding this, what do you think the king of the Jews thinks when some foreign sheiks show up and ask for driving directions to go visit the king of the Jews? Yeah. You want to talk about paranoid. So he panics. Look what he does in verse 4. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah, remember Messiah means king, anointed one, where the king was to be born. He puts a plan into action. He turns around and barks out, hey, get the religious authorities on the horn and get them over here now. He lays out a map. He says, we've got 400 square miles to work with. Where is this Messiah, this king, supposed to be born? The religious authorities respond in verse 6. Verse 6 in block lettering is right out of Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Huh, okay, that knocks out the northern region. Bethlehem. Five miles away from Jerusalem. You bet he's panicking. By the way, these religious authorities here, these are the pastors of the day. Do you find it a little bit odd that if there's a miraculous prophecy if there's a miraculous star, if there's pagans from the east that are coming to confirm this, don't you think they might be just slightly interested in checking this thing out? Maybe even just a field trip to go see if it's the real deal? And yet there seems to be ambivalence, and I would say that it's not real ambivalence. I would say it's outright rejection. There's another interesting thing here. Herod seems to believe the facts of the Bible, doesn't he? I mean, he takes it as authoritative, and yet he doesn't worship. I mean, the application is all over the page right there. How many do we know in Christendom actually know their Bible, believe their Bible, but they don't worship the king? Watch what Herod does next, verse 7. Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and what? Worship. Circle it again. Worship him. And under a veil of deceit, he gathers more information so that he can build a metaphorical fortress around his throne. And what we see is if you look down at verse 16, he goes from protection of his throne to aggression from his throne. Look down at verse 16. When Herod saw that he'd been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its vicinity from two years old and under according to the time which had been determined from the Magi. If you're a Jew reading this, and remember, Matthew's gospel was written to the Jews, what connection did you just make about children dying and being slaughtered? That's Exodus right there. God is at work again. In the midst of an assault upon God's people, God will preserve His anointed God will preserve that which will bring about salvation. We saw it in Exodus, didn't we? 
When Herod saw he had been tricked, he became enraged. Let's be honest, that's, that's the way you respond when you're protecting your throne. That's the way when, when self is ruling on the throne, you respond to protect it at all costs. Now, it's easy to look at Herod and point the finger. This guy, is, he, he's a Stalin. He's a murderer, okay? But I think it's fair before we move on, if we're to take the admonition, don't worship like Herod, that even as believers we need to look at this and see if maybe we don't see Herod looking back at us in the mirror. Just a bit. If worship is all that I am responding to all that I know of him, and Herod lives for self, self self-worship on his throne, is there something we can learn? Are there some tendencies we need to avoid? Well, again, if you looked at the outer veneer of Herod, he's a Jew. Not really, but he comes across as a Jew, a follower of Yahweh, someone who believes in the Bible, someone who is consulted by other quote-unquote believers, and yet all of this is merely an intellectual ascent. The very truth of God's word has not traveled the 18 inches to his heart. There is no evidence of repentance and faith. Herod, frankly, is not unlike many in the buckle of the Bible belt where they have all the trappings and traditions of Christianity, but the thought of someone else being king on our throne troubles us greatly. When there is a threat to something or someone that we worship, we all of a sudden get hostile, don't we? I'll promise you, Herod never came out and said, I don't believe the Bible anymore. I don't believe in Yahweh. I want to worship Zeus. He never did that. But when his throne was under attack, he did everything possible to protect it, even under the guise of being a covenant member of God's community. That scares me. That scares me because while I may not be murdering, while I may not actually have a physical throne, are there times when confronted with Christ's will, Christ's call for me to be obedient in what I desire, that I become very self-protective? That I, that I, I turn and twist or, or whatever I need to do to say, you know, yeah, I really don't want to do that. I don't really need to do that. And I don't know how Herod rationalized whether he thought it was a real Messiah or wasn't. It makes no difference. The point is, is that Herod worships self. He can say all day long, he's a believer, he believes in Yahweh, he believes in the Hebrew Scriptures, he's the king of the Jews, and it can be the the furthest thing from the truth. I don't want us to sit around and doubt our salvation. I don't mean that. But go back to what Jonathan Edwards said. You want to know whether you're a believer or not? Who do you worship? Where are your affections? And if there's something above Jesus Christ that your affections are being placed somewhere else, Exodus calls that having other gods before me. You ever think about that? Ten Commandments is not a list of rules. Ten Commandments says this is what it looks like to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love others as an overflow of that. That's the Decalogue. All right, well, let's learn how to then worship like wise men. Let me spend just a minute and talk about these magi because these magi do not have any sort of uh, outer veneer that looks remotely Uh, like worship of Yahweh. It looks remotely Christian, we might say today. We don't know whether whether there was three of them. We don't know whether they were kings. And we certainly aren't aware of their names. So all that stuff you learned growing up, you got to kind of throw out as tradition. In fact, it was possible that there were far more than three and that they showed up in Jerusalem in an entourage with soldiers. So now imagine that. Uh, Excuse me. Yeah, we need some driving directions to visit the king of the Jews, and there's a whole sort of army. Some believe that they were uh, uh, Parthians, which had been driven out of the Palestinian area by Herod himself. 
Here's what we do know. We know that the Magi were a priestly political class of the, uh, the Persians and the Medes. They were skilled in astronomy, astrology, and were well known for their sorcery. We also know that they were monotheistic, pagan, but monotheistic. They believed in one God. Many attributed uh, or became followers of Zoroastrianism, which is in Iran still today, very, very old religion. And because of their skill in the sciences, they became advisors to the kings of Babylon and Persia. You're starting to recognize this now because when King Nebuchadnezzar wanted dreams interpreted, who did he call? The Magi. And who couldn't do it? The Magi. And who was able to do it? Daniel. And then what position was Daniel elevated to? The head of this class of Magi. They're the highest ranking officials during Daniel's era. And what we see is that they have been perhaps impacted by Daniel's writings. That they know something of this prophecy. And when they see the star, we don't understand why or how, but they're familiar with what is to happen. And that this is to signify where the king of the Jews is to be born. So let me recap here. These magi were Gentiles from a foreign land come to worship at the foot of a Jewish king. You think, you think Matthew's making a point here? You think he's drawing us in? In you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Look at his genealogy. We've got four Gentile women. What was Matthew? He was treated as a Gentile. Even though he was a Jew, he was a tax collector. This Savior, this King has come to save the people from their sins, not just the Jews alone, not just to fulfill what we think of in the Abrahamic covenant, but in this King, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Salvation has been brought to all by this King, and He is worthy to be worshipped. Another interesting thing is they're immersed in paganism, and yet, as pagan as they are, in contrast to Herod, they give up so much to come and worship. They're eager to give up their throne. They're eager to give up their high position. Look at verse 2. We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. You've got to understand, we read that because we're familiar with the Christmas story, but that's crazy. No one worships Queen Elizabeth. Okay, some Brits worship Queen Elizabeth. They shouldn't, but no, but you don't worship a king. You revere, you honor. We've come to worship this king. This is a pilgrimage, and it was a deliberate act. Like the shepherds, they drop everything, and they make it a priority. They, they travel for months. They leave their businesses behind. Their, their counseling business, their fortune-telling business, whatever they have, and they come to worship how much more should we as Christians? Nothing is more important than worship. I, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. You can send me emails, not before Wednesday of this week, okay? But nothing should supplant our time together. Now, I realize there's times you're traveling and people are sick and whatever else. But in this day and age, do you know the average, how often the average Christian attends services in DFW? You want to guess? one in five weeks. I'm not talking about liberal churches. One in five weeks. Those are statistics from the Southern Baptists of Texas Convention. One in five weeks. My question is, is what is vying for your time Sunday morning? Well, we realize there's a lot out there, but do we as Christians actually choose select soccer? Do we actually choose sleeping in? Do we actually choose these things? Sometimes we do. If these complete pagans were seeking to worship the King of Kings and left their homeland and left everything to do it, how much more for us to make this a priority? Side note here, it's not my notes. I'll probably get in trouble for it. I got a friend, or, a friend of mine who pastors in Colorado, and I said, uh, What's your greatest challenge there, pastoring? And he says, when people want to go spend family time and worship on the mountain on Sunday morning. 
go skiing, go hiking, whatever else. Now you think about how ungodly that is to actually say, take something good, family time, and say, God would rather have me spend time with my family rather than come and worship. No. Worship is all that I am responding to all that I know of Him. Those may be immature responses, but as we grow in Christ, this will become priority. Look at verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly. I I, I don't know what that looks like. I I haven't really seen it in in the movies, but I, I just kind of imagine that they're riding along on their horses, 